Today's episode of The Beauty Of with the just absolute joy of a human, Timothy Goodman, is up right now. If you're not following this beautiful art, I got I have my own personal piece of art officially here. Signed. Signed. <laughs> One of a kind is One up right of a now. Kind just for you. Just, just for you. You really know how because to Because of make those nails. Special. Show the nails. Hi friends, welcome back to the Beauty of an Ultra Beauty podcast, where we talk with and listen uh, to pioneers who are helping us redefine what beauty is and where it lives. I am David Lopez. I've been called many things. If you watch, you know, and you listen, you know, um, amongst celebrity hairstylist, uh, feel good beauty content creator, um, and lots of other things that shall remain silent for now. But today I am your host. Uh, before we get started, I'd like to remind everyone that this is a safe space. It's a judgment-free zone where we honor curiosity and respect, where we want to open our minds and our hearts. Speaking of opening up our minds and our hearts, I'm so excited to welcome Timothy Goodman. Yeah, it's to great to be of. here. Thank you. It's so lovely to be here and to meet you. And yeah, I'm ready you to... have such a warm presence. Um, that's the Ohio in me. That's the Ohio in you. I have Cleveland. to say, I've... shout out Cleveland. What's up? <laughs> shout out Cleveland. <laughs> shout out Cleveland. I haven't lived there in 18 years, but you still own it. You oh, still like. I haven't changed my my area code on my my oh, phone number because go I got to I got to stay true to the roots. Oh, that's interesting. You know, I want to I want to get into that a little bit later, actually. Um, <laughs> but one of the things that's uh, really lovely is that having not met you but seen your work. And seeing the energy in person, seeing that really reflect really from like a deep inner source. Like it doesn't feel like something that's a character that's created. It, and as yeah. someone that in my world, I spread joy, but from you see through the characters. lens of adversity, you know, there's depth there. Where does that come from? I, I mean, you share a lot. I mean, and you, you share a lot about mental health struggles and you, you talk a lot about depth. Is there something to be said about people who... Um, are open enough to feel such darkness that it allows them to mm. feel even more light. Well, you know what? It's it's interesting, right? Like, I feel lonely a lot. It's like an existential loneliness. I can be madly in love. I can be heartbroken. I can be single. I can be lonely. I can, you know, anything can be going on in my life. But that loneliness, it's always there a little bit in the pit of my stomach. That feeling of like the questions, right? Like. What is life? Why am I here? What is this all about? What What does it matter if I post on Instagram or not because the algorithm is fucking up? Like, what? Can we swear? Yeah. Here? So, you know. Do it. whatever you want. <laughs> I can be, whatever. <laughs> but like, all these things like boil up inside of you and you have to confront your own life. You yeah. have to confront your own existence, you know? Yeah. And that always stays with me. So that make that humbles me in a lot of ways, you know? And I try to honor that loneliness. People put the stigma mm -hmm. on it, but it's actually quite beautiful. It's that beautiful. rawness of what it means to be human is really important to me. And so that is important no matter what I'm doing in life. There's something to be said about it. I, I'm... <laughs> I have felt alone my whole life. It's one of the reasons I live in New York because yeah, exactly. I can be alone and feel feelings of loneliness but not have to see it around me. I'm still around people. I can be on a subway train surrounded by people and I still oh, feel man. alone. I think that there's something to be said about um, the idea that especially now, and I know people like this who hate being alone, like they always need to have plans, be around people. Of course, and of course. even though we feel lonely, <laughs> we still like dive into the loneliness. I'm like, yeah. no, I want to be alone no, with I need this to, loneliness. Exactly. I need to know what that is. It's interesting, right? Like I'm, uh, I was just talking to my, my partner, my girlfriend, Tina, recently about this because, you know, we've been together for about uh, like a year and three months or whatever. And it's terrific. I love her to death. I'm going to marry that girl. Right? Hey, like she's my everything. But there's something like we were talking about. I was like, you know, I realized like it can be really difficult at times for someone like me because if I'm feeling sad, right? Sadness is not depression, first of all. You need to, and that's important for Separate us to remember. Mm -hmm. But to say I'm feeling sad about something. You know, in a relationship, your instinct is your partner is feeling down or if you're like, what's wrong, babe? Like, how can I help you? Like, what? Up? And there's something about remembering, like, what it means to honor that sadness and, like, go have, be, go be alone, have a sad dinner by yourself, 
you know, like Melancholy. watch, t- you know, what, yeah, and mm-hmm. feel that and not have to fix it, not have to answer to it, not have to not explain, explain it. it. Yes. Mm-hmm. And so that's interesting being in a relationship because you and but it's beautiful that we can talk about this, you know, and like share that kind of stuff. But it's interesting that you bring that up because you do, you have to honor that, you know, and that yeah. that's important, especially as a creative person, you know, because sometimes I'm writing things, I'm coming up with project ideas, I'm writing poetry a lot, I put it on walls, I do this. I that that sadness I need to stay with it because it also like comes out in beautiful ways creatively. Mm-hmm. Now you gotta be careful because you don't want to like wait for that or use that as a crutch. Yeah, because that's not being or, yeah. proactive about your mental health, of course. But yeah, yeah. That I I had a question written down. I I'm wondering maybe this is kind of the answer to it. Is you do share so much of your general human experience. Um, and the, the, the kind of like highs and lows of what it is to be a human today outside of the world that's swaying around us kind of politically and socially, just the general human experience of feeling emotion, what parts of you are not shared or not Mm. expressed, or do you really share? Are, are there things that say kind of sequestered that are like, no, this is for me. And this is something that I experienced solely in here. It doesn't become my art. Where do the worlds blend and where do they kind of stay separate? Well, you know, it's interesting. Like I've gotten better about that more recently. I would say in the last year, year and a half, you know, there's parts of my relationship that I definitely don't share. You know, lots of my relationship. I used to share more with that kind of stuff. I've learned to keep these things sacred. Sacred is yes. the word that I've been using. I'm, yeah. Yes. I'm, and so yes, that, word. you know, so there's tons about my relationship at this point that I do not share anymore in any way. Not whether it's a stupid Instagram story or a piece of poetry that I write. That I just don't. Um, but, you know, I think that, I don't know. I don't know. I've always juggled with that, like that balance as an artist, like, how much is too much, you know? I mean, we all do this with, mm. with social media, right? right? And then anybody who has any sort of a following too, you start, that. then that becomes a topic of struggle, I think. It's like, well, how much do you want to share? But people like that, so you want to do Well, that. especially like, because, you know, I think for you, and I mean, at least in my experience as a creator on specifically Instagram is that that's why they came to you. Yeah, they yeah. want to feel less alone. So you know that about your work, you know that, they're following you because you're sharing this because even reading your things, they resonated with me that I, you feel less alone. And it's a very, very real oh, response that. in a world <laughs> where you feel alone, especially as people like us that are just feel lonely. I don't think enough people express that they feel lonely. Yeah, I don't yeah, think yeah, enough yeah. people express that they feel like they're the only ones that feel these feelings. And especially for me, speaking for myself and what I see, not enough cishet white men. Oh yeah, you we're know, gonna get into that. Being able to talk about loneliness, depression, yes. trauma, th- let alone therapy. Cause mm-hmm. you gotta deal with that kind of stuff to even wanna go to therapy mm-hmm. or you gotta confront it. And so um, that is a, a, a sort of goal of mine, an objective of mine to kind of like, you know, to be able to like break down some of that stuff to hopefully inspire other men who might be like me, look like me to wanna confront that kind of stuff. Because, you know, we gotta choose, uh, of vulnerability and and emotional intelligence over apathy and aggression, which is you know kind of the Where issue did that with come the world. From? I mean, you you are a, a cis white male. Where did where did this come from? Was it a learned thing? Because it's it's not unfortunately, <clears throat> unfortunately, the stereotype of a cis white male, especially in twenty twenty two, is is not this. And yeah, in like, a lot of ways, we're like going backwards in some ways. Yeah. You know, right now, especially with the with social media and some of the people that have been um, touted as being like, oh, well, you know, this is how men should be. Where did this even come from, or where was it born? Uh, well, it, I think it comes from a Cleveland. Yeah, it comes from, you know, growing up without like a real father in the house, mm. not knowing my my birth dad, having a strong relationship with my grandmother, with my mother, you know, I think it starts there. I still, I, I still to this day deal with my own toxic masculinity, you know, and like what it means to kind of like continuously break down, um, you know, the attitudes and the postures I adopted as like a young boy. You know, I didn't grow up, we grew up poor, we grew up in, in a rough neighborhood. I grew up, you know, 
calling women hoes and bitches and all these things and like adopting all these things I saw in media and through rock and rap albums and like the way people talked in my neighborhood and all this stuff. And so, but I had a, I had a strong interest to like want to break out of that. I always had a strong interest to break out of anything that mm. pe that whatever was like normal around me. Couldn't find you in any way. Yeah. And so I don't know. I don't know where it really comes from. I think it also like comes from the fact that I grew up in an all black neighborhood for the first mm. 12 years of my life. So seeing how race and then moving to a more predominantly white neighborhood after that, seeing how race started to play into things and mm -hmm. how I thought about things that my then white friends didn't understand because I kind of like grew up around different kinds of people that they did. Mm. So the my my, my uh, curiosity about race at such an early age was something that most white boys didn't think about. So then I think in my 20s, I started to adopt that same philosophy to the gender and to sex because then I'm like, well, wait, what, why am I doing this? But then I'm saying, well, don't say the N-word, but I'm calling women this. Mm. Or wait, no, I shouldn't be doing this either. Like what? And then so it started to break down that way, I think in a lot of ways early on for me. So and then I just kept going from there. You and know? you keep going and you keep going and keep going. And you just keep unlearning. It's not difficult. It's not it's difficult. It's not difficult. And also there's not an end goal with it other than just to be a decent human being. Yeah, and, <laughs> and to listen to people, who, whatever they say they are, or however they feel right. or whatever they want in life, let them have That's that. That's their experience Why and respect it, it. It doesn't, it's not, yeah. Was it ever difficult for you though because while I am a brown queer person and there's privilege in even still in this body that I have in the presentation I have been in rooms where people will say things about people who are more marginalized than I am but I always tell any panel I'm on everything anything I talk about about the struggles of queer brown black people I don't care about what I'm saying I'm talking to my community yeah I care about the cis white male really hetero male that's listening to me, what are they saying and doing when I'm not in the room? Yeah, yeah. How are they holding each other accountable? Exactly. Was Did you ever find discomfort in holding, if you're in a largely white space, you're yeah. in a room with like five cis, white, hetero men, and someone says something derogatory about women, gay, trans, was it ever hard for you to speak up and say something? And that's okay. That's that's okay. This is judgment for. I mean, it, no, it could no, have been. Yeah, yeah, I think early on, maybe I think you know you you start to like you start to recognize that it starts bothering you, hmm. and then and then you're like you let something pass, and then you feel you feel guilty about it. So then you the next time it happens, hmm. you do it, and then maybe you kind of go through this thing where maybe someone does that and it catches you off guard, and you let it fly, and then you feel and then. And that, so I think it's this constant kind of like flex. But at this point, I mean, first of all, I'm never in a room with just five white guys. Yeah, I don't I even know. Like, that's just never been my makeup. You're like, what is that? I don't even know. Like, that actually freaks me out. <laughs> yeah, um, I can't relate. But, uh, <laughs> um, you know, I think at this point, it, it's just not difficult. Yeah, you know, really I think hard. it's really not. You know, it's just, and you have to, you know, and I think at this point, when when you start to get an audience too and you start to confront these kind of things and push on people i think it's so important you know it's just it's but it's not hard mm -hmm. i don't know in terms of since we talk about like toxic masculinity beauty and we're on a beauty podcast did you ever have your own discovery of like beauty or feeling beautiful or you know a lot of what you tap into is you know by society perceived as feminine what is your relationship like with femininity or feeling in some ways feminine? Do you ever yeah. feel that way? And then even in your self-care, like did that translate yeah, in yeah, any yeah, way yeah. for you? I think in some ways, you know, I don't I don't know if I ever feel feminine, but I definitely feel not masculine. Oh. You know what okay. I mean? Yeah. So yeah. and however we like define masculinity. Yeah. And I've always been, at least since like my early like, I don't know, I, at least since my late teens, I've always felt pretty okay with that. You know Good. what I mean? I'm like, glad. I've always, like, leaned into that, like, yeah, I I don't care if, like, I'm supposed to be this or whatever. Like, like you never care I about like to write poetry. Okay. I like wearing pink. I like wearing writing poetry. I like telling, you know, my partner, like, I like shouting from the rooftops that I love this girl. You know what I mean? Like, <laughs> yeah. why aren't men doing this more? Yeah. You know? Like... I've always been okay with that, yeah. and, and I'm thankful for that. You know, I've never really like struggled with that side. Now, 
that said, I also still to this day call myself a recovering misogynist mm. because I think like, any cishet straight man in this, especially in this country, if they really look in the mirror, they have to, they have to, they, they would see that they are, you know, a misogynist one way or the other. I think when you, from what you learn in the society and the, and the way your family and our, these communities we grew up in, there's just no way you're not, you know? And so I still am like wrestling with, you know, constantly kind of like unlearning certain kind of like behaviors and postures I've always adopted, you know, mm -hmm. from that. So I think that, you know, in ways that maybe I've, looked at relationships or looked at, you know, or, or people I've been in the past, mm -hmm. you know, so. I find it really fascinating, just like all of this, because I think I don't ever give myself the opportunity. I mean, listen, I, I'm friends with lots of different types of people, but I, I will say, I don't know that I meet many cishet men like you. Do you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And I think that there's something very real about you making space for your experience and the experience of others because it, there is trauma in like my first experiences with just heteronormative yeah. period. You know what I mean? You talk about wanting to write poetry. Like I love writing poetry. I always have. Writing is a secret hobby of mine. And I remember we did in AP literature, we did like a poetry thing and we had to do this whole section. We each presented a book of poems in different styles of poems. And I got him from the class and I read a poem. And of course, I mean, I got called gay yeah, my whole yeah. life. My poem was called Real Men Cry. And I could I not have picked this. a worse <laughs> poem to read <laughs> at a military a school, by the way. Military yeah. school? And I remember I finished the poem and it was a good poem. And you still have it? It's, yeah, I still have it. Oh, we need As, we need Oh yeah, it's good. Um, <laughs> as corny as like the title was, it actually was like, I mean, for being 17, like it was like, oh, you know, like that was pretty good. I finished the poem and this guy, now I think it's hilarious. I think it's funny. This guy in the background, he's like, you're gay. And I was like, oh my God. And I like, think about it now, I laugh. And now it's like a joke with my friends. Like my friends were like, you're gay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But back then I'm holding a poem called Real Men Cry and then a tear falls down my face. Do you know what I mean? Like, wow. I'm just like, I can't believe it just shared this like vulnerability of like the male yeah, experience and, yeah, yeah. and it still was made about my sexuality. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That was like really It's so wild. Like when I think about that word growing up, you know, like, you know, I was never like, um, a person, I, like, I was never a bully or anything. I never like would call, I would never say that to someone yeah. I didn't know was good. But we would say it all the time to like, I would say it to my brother. Yeah. Or I would like, you're, you're oh, messing you around. Like you're just like, yeah, yeah, yeah. And it's just like, we didn't even think that like what that meant. It's so interesting that it was always applied to just like, you're being like stupid. You're being a dork. You're being, and then what we would say that word. And you the know? same language with women that yeah. we apply to, yeah. uh, to men, you know? Yeah. Um, there was a quote that you had that I believe you said it was something that a friend said to you that we should not love our partners the way we need to be loved, but we should love them the way they need to be loved. Yeah. So there's this concept that of course, love your partner the way you need it. So you receive it back. And it's about showing up. It's about showing up. It's about showing up. And I think what's What's cool about that is it transcends beyond your partners, in your friendships, yeah. in your relationships with other people, yeah. and just in general in your life, right? I do think that that requires a certain amount of curiosity mm -hmm. because, like you said, showing up, you you have to be curious about what other people's needs are. Yeah. And how does that show well, up for you? How do you stay curious? Well, I think it's curiosity, but it's also like a form of like um, self-actualization or mm. something, you know? And I think that stems from years of therapy. And I think that stems from, you know, really just getting to the point where, you know, for so long, right? Like I would hide behind my work, my career and going after my dreams and all this, you know, as a form of, it was just a, it was just a mask, for, Even though your ma your work was so I, highly yeah like but it's personal. still a mask mm. of like confronting and showing up and being there for certain kinds of people being there for myself being there for my own self care of like carving out space to not be working 
to, you know, and so like a couple years ago, like I started learning French. Like I always want to learn French. I was like, I'm going to start doing this. You know, this is not for yeah. my career. This is not for, you know, this is not for anything else, but for me and my brain. And do you speak French now? On pool. <laughs> it's more than what it's I know. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I don't want to embarrass myself right now. So. But I'm, I'm not bad. Um, but, and then I went and I was like, I want, I've ne I, I, in college, right? I went to an art school here in, in the city. Shout out SVA. Okay. Um, but I, I never, you know, I always like kind of like kids who would go abroad, you know, study abroad programs. I was always jealous of those kids. I couldn't do that. I have the money. So I was like, you know, like I'm at this point, I'm going to learn French. I'm going to go to Paris for like six months and just do it. Just do it. And I did it. And you did. And I did. And it was there's like, a this book is the now. And now there's a graphic memoir about it. But it's funny because I went there, like I'm going here just for myself, you know. And it was just one of the most incredible experiences of my life. Can you, you summarize know? it for me? Of, of what? The six months in Paris. Uh, it was a whirlwind. Yeah. If I if I had to say in one word, you know, yeah. it was just a whirlwind of. Uh, showing up for myself for the first time in my life and in, in my adult life, you know. What was it about way. Paris specifically? New I just York always wanted to be, you know, sometimes you have these romantic kind of ideas about things. Uh, what, my first dream was to be a, an artist in New York City. I was able to accomplish that. And one of my the other dreams was to go to be an artist in Paris and, you know, and kind of like live that, that, that dream and see if you could do it. And I did it, you know, and uh, it was incredible because I was able to, take a step back, you know, and take a deep breath. I had gone through like deep depression in 2018 and where I was, you know, thinking about suicide a lot. I was thinking about, you know, um, just quitting everything. Like I was in a really bad place for a long time. And so when I came out of that on the other side in 2019, I really wanted to uh, pay myself back, you know, and do something nice for myself and do something I always wanted to do. So I found, you know, I planned and prepared for months to do it, you know. And so it was, um, you know, just a really beautiful, much needed experience that I would recommend. You know, it was just something that I felt like I just had. It's like some people need to go in the woods. Yeah. Some people yeah. have to, you know. Yeah. And that was something I needed to do, you know. Was there something about you making that decision for yourself from that depression and, and acknowledging that? The kind of state that you were in to make the decision for yourself to learn French and go to Paris. Do you think that maybe that unlocked something in you that when you went to Paris, you were even more, I imagine making a decision and actually going through with it. I always think about keys, you know, yeah, it's just yeah, like yeah. it unlocked something. So when you went to Paris, you come there with like, I did it. Oh, yeah. Like your heart's open. Like you're like, I made the oh, decision. My heart was busting with mm. love, you know, and I fell in love in Paris. We had a tremendous short relationship <laughs> that this kind of book is centered around yeah um and it was you know very heartbreaking in the end for me but it, that heartbreak allowed me to really to really kind of like finally you know my relationship now with my girlfriend tina um none of that would be possible without that you know because I went for it for the first time, you know, like coming from a broken home, coming from the, the kind of family I came from growing up, you know, I didn't see love in the house. I didn't see communication in the house. I didn't see joy. You know, I saw people, two, two people, you know, my mother and my stepfather uh, for, for a bit there. Uh, who it was loveless, you know, and there w and there was yelling and there was, you know, and I suffered abuse at the hands of my stepfather, you know, something I couldn't even admit until, you know, just, you know, years ago. So um, it's it's interesting because you you start to come up with these ideas about, especially as a as a as a cishet man growing up in your twenties, and you're like, then you start to have these ideas about relationships where you kind of because of what I saw growing up. Then I just equate relationship with suffering, with you know, with um, uh, like something that I felt embarrassed about, mm -hmm. something I didn't see that was a real potential for growth and change, and something that could bring a lot of value to my life. I mm -hmm. instead saw it as something that you know I thought was was I don't know it would take away from from my life, yeah. you know, and so. And through all of that, you're using art really to in a lot of ways express your own journey with mental health and and your again your human experience 
Do you recognize that for your audience, it's maybe their first inroad into even thinking about mental health and maybe seeking help? People will see a piece of your art and think, I have felt that way. This person then has taken steps to help themselves. Do you recognize how your art helps people in that way? Um, and what kind of responsibility uh, responsibility do you feel in the future art that you're creating? Mm. I mean, I recognize it when people tell me and I love yeah. and I'm thankful for that, of course. Um, you know, I think it's funny as an artist, sometimes you have to just, responsibility is an interesting word, right? Mm -hmm. Like, mm -hmm. do we have a responsibility? Mm -hmm. I don't know. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I have a responsibility to not do something that is unethical, mm -hmm. you know, which so, I think that that's how I, but I don't know if I have a responsibility to do anything that I don't want to do as an artist. I can go any which way, you know what I mean? Like, do you know, it's, an, it's if I wanted to start doing oil paintings that were completely abstract tomorrow, well, I hope people would support me, you know yeah. what I mean? So it's interesting as a, a that word responsibility. Yeah. But I do feel responsibility when I talk about something. Okay. When I decide to, to speak up and talk yeah. about something, to come correct. You know what I mean? Mm. And I do have responsibility as an artist that whatever I'm putting out in the world, say I'm doing a wall mural that has a big thing, something I've written, right? Well, I have a responsibility to not offend someone. You know what I mean? And if I do, then I have a responsibility to listen and to learn why and to unlearn, you know, certain things. So so those are the responsibilities I feel as an artist, you know? Yeah. Um, and, and I have, you know, and so that's important to me. What does listening even look like for mm. people who are listening to this podcast? But when you say listening, what does that look like? Well, you know, like, I, so it's interesting. Like, I, I think criticism is good as an artist. 100%. However we define quote unquote, hate is a different story. Yeah. Like hate is whatever. But if you're getting praise from eight to 10 people and two people come to you and say, you know, you've offended this community or not, you have an obligation to listen to them and to understand why what you did might have off you know offended them. And so that's what listening is like. No matter what you're praising, listen to the people who, you know, that doesn't mean, you know, for instance, I just did something for a big brand, right? Now, in some ways, I think, well, we're all participating in this big, ugly thing called capitalism. Consumerism, we're doing capitalism. Our, we're all doing it. We're doing it right here. Literally. Right? Commodify so, every part of my soul. Yeah. <laughs> I did something for a, a big brand recently. I got a lot, of, a lot of people thought it was really cool. And then a couple of people were like, oh, they do this, this, and this. Well, I think that it's important for me to listen to them, you know, and like talk and have that dialogue, you know, and not just go, oh, well, this or that or whatever. Now, at the same time, I do think that we're all, like, unless I'm aligning myself with someone that is actively racist or homophobic or whatever, it's we can't tricky. Escape it. It's tricky, you know, but I still want to listen to, these, to someone who might be criticizing mm -hmm. me, you know? Mm -hmm. um, and I think because they deserve to be heard, you know? Yeah. And, and I also have an obligation to think about these things going forward with whoever I'm aligning myself with. And that goes back to what you said, like you want to listen and unlearn. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, great. That it's such a great conversation. Um, I want to switch it up. We're going to play a card Let's game. It. Let's do it. <laughs> <laughs> it's fun. I promise. It's not going to be um, comp competitive at all. Okay. Um, You're going to... Basically, it's just a series of questions. All the cards have a question. I'm going to set out three cards. Here, I'll uh -oh. set out two cards. <laughs> and you're gonna pick one and I'm gonna pick one. And then we're gonna ask each other the question that's on the card. We just ask, that's it. We just, and, and hopefully I I answer. Can, you know, Hopefully I, answer, I you might say no, I don't wanna answer. But uh, while I <laughs> shuffle these cards too, I have to tell you, um, it, uh, as someone that feels love deeply, I'll never forget my first heartbreak. Uh, yeah. It was with a girl, LOL. I mean, it doesn't make it any less, but <laughs> I did love her immensely sure. in high school. But yeah. I remember, laying on the floor with my head on my mom's lap and sobbing. And it was my first time ever feeling that pain, like the love pain, the first time you ever feel it. And I remember telling my mom, like, will it always hurt like this? And her just being like, yes. Yes, yes. It always will. Yes. And oh my God, that was like, so ugh, like, ugh. but now um, as 
someone, <laughs> I talk about it often, I am very much in love right now. And you wrote, thank you. You wrote this very beautiful poem about Tina, your oh, uh, a partner. recent one, yeah, about just like the the just, like, yeah. just what it is to be in love as a fully realized human, and how all your past experience. I think you talked about sweeping the floor, like yeah, 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 all yeah. your whole life. It <laughs> wouldn't have allowed you to be where you are now to love this deeply. The people of our past were supposed to be there, and they were supposed to pass. Yes. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> I would say put it like write it down but it's been written down it's on your Instagram okay <laughs> go ahead and pick a card you're my guest I'll let you pick a card right, first I'm gonna go left okay great and as my guest I will let you read the question first alright David what's the one thing that people always misunderstand about you <laughs> oh god um I would say people misunderstand my presentation of myself in the world as someone that is put together. I myself consider myself to be a very mm. uh, intellectually, emotionally, physically messy person. Yeah, yeah, I don't yeah. think most people would ever think of me that way. Are you messy um, in a physically way. in your house? No, I'm not actually. You're like dishes out. And I, I'm not actually, but I I find mess in the way. Like I, someone would be like, your apartment's <laughs> immaculate. And I'm like, it's messy. This one thing. It's my, you, I'm like this. Yeah, because you haven't opened no, no, the closet. To to you, oh, you know yeah, what I mean? Yeah, like, oh, if go. you open that closet, I'm like hiding it away. I'm like, if you uh, open okay, that closet, yeah. my life in the last 30 years will pop out. So <laughs> there's mess hiding. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but I think people misunderstand that. And people always think I live in LA. Always. Oh. I don't know why. Um, this right. question is interesting. I'm still going to ask it because why not? I can, I can decline? Yeah, I, I mean, maybe. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. All right. Who first told you you were beautiful and did you believe them i guess my mother okay she would always say like well are we saying like literally the word beautiful or can it, you're just a yeah, beautiful per like whoever just she would always you just, feel that she way just, like, she, i remember she would be like putting my coat on or something she's like your eyes are gorgeous you're beautiful and your little nose and she would do she would really build me up yeah my mom was like my oh i love fan. that yeah she's like and it should always be like you should always wear blue because it brings out your beautiful eyes i love that so, yeah are you so close to your mom yeah yeah shout out to mom same shout out to mommy love, love you mom. so much <laughs> um thank you for playing that game um also behind me because we're kind of like a newer podcast um i have a wall of things mm. behind me that we like slowly build up over time so i'm filling it up with like sentimental things but first i want to talk about this t-shirt i believe that this is a collaboration you did with ulta yeah yep um, and can you tell us what it says on here? Not that I want to make you perform your art, it but says, perform your art. Beauty is here <laughs> and there, and you and me and tall and short and boundless and wellness and wrinkled and feminine and masculine and non-binary and everybody. Well, shout out to Ulta Beauty you and go. you for creating this in collaboration together. It's so stunning. I can Thanks. wait, I'm gonna take this one. It's cool. Yeah. Maybe I'll make a little crop top out of it. Yes. Love that. All things beauty, all in one place. All to beauty. Okay. And then you have something that you brought to leave on our I did. Shelf. I did. I think I, I gave I think it I to someone. It I think it's in this brown box. I brought yes? two things. They're both in this brown box. Okay. Fantastic. Um, okay. So I'll give this to you. Okay. And so then I'm you home. can present however you'd like to present it. We're done with the just, question game? Do uh, you want to play one more? I don't know. I, okay. We'll play one more. We can go back. Here. Oh, you want to do this? Yeah. All right. All right. Do another one. All right. <laughs> this was a good one. I, I feel like I know the answer, but... Huh. When was the first time you felt seen? Whew. Can you remember um, the first time you felt seen? I mean, I really think that, oh, there's so many different stages of uh, that. being seen. Yeah. Absolutely, I yes. Mean, but I, I but mean, what's your first recollection of like what that felt like? Um, I guess it would be, it really not until I started going to, I went to community college. Okay. Um, I took a couple years off of after college or after high school, and then I started going to community college. And um, I was taking classes. I was taking like life drawing classes and all these art classes. And I had someone, a teacher of mine, sit me down and say, um, just really was really encouraging and just really was like, I think, like I see something different in you than all the other students here. Like you're really expressing yourself, you're really trying, you're doing this. And I just had never thought anybody 
would care about anything I ever made. And so it was the first time that someone just gave me a little slice of encouragement that maybe I could do this. And that's, it's so important. Like it's wild how people, we just, so many people don't have that, you know, and don't have access to that, especially growing up. So when you get a little piece of like, you're really good at this. Mm. Like maybe you should pursue this. Mm-hmm. It just blew my whole. And think about how it changed the trajectory of your yeah, life. It was like essentially. Everything. And it was such a simple little like comment too from yeah. her, from my teacher, but. What was her name? Uh, Mrs. Freeman. Mrs. Freeman. Jackie Freeman. Jackie Freeman. Shout out Jackie Freeman. <laughs> Shout out. Okay, now we can get to this box that we're gonna leave. Thank you for sharing that story. I yeah. I, I talk a lot about and I think a lot about how important teachers are and, and teachers small and words mentors, of encouragement. Like, like it just changed world. your whole life to be able to have that small encouragement and yeah. it's led us to this t shirt, your art, like your whole experience at the senior it's it's very special. All right. So I brought two objects. Okay. Um I don't know if you want to get rid of this already. Okay, right yeah. <laughs> I brought a marker that has my name on it. <laughs> okay, I am a I'm a stationary person. I and love you're markers have and that. pens. Yeah, thank you. Because drawing with a marker is where it really all started for me. Yeah. Like so this is using... this is a sharp a sharpie for those listening. Yeah. It's it's essentially a, a a sharpie style marker. Yeah. And um, it has your signature, and I guess is that your logo? No, it's just kind it's of a just fun a, little a drawing. Mouth with a tongue. I, I'm obsessed kind of, with it. Yeah. Can people find this somewhere else? Uh, no, just no, like it's just like, like a strictly me thing that I give out. Oh, your nails are fantastic. God, by thank the way. you, oh, thank goodness. you. Yeah. If you have never designed nail art, I think it's time. I know. I you probably should. should be, I should be doing it. You know, there's only so many hours in a day. <laughs> true, true. And cut to me like, hey, do you want to help me? Okay, yeah. Okay, so I love yeah. this. Thank you. So, thank but that's you. where that's where all this started for me. You know, using a sharpie. I'm Is really this your like, medium? Like you? you well, sharpie? it really be. That's what it be. Ganas and not anymore necessarily. Okay. Like now, I draw digitally. I draw. Yeah. I do spray paint on walls. I do markers. Smell I do all sorry. kinds of stuff. But I still use sharpies, of course. Okay. And then here is a sticker that is something I wrote years ago. It says, "Don't look for love. Look for pizza." Very similar. <laughs> <laughs> the simplest, the simplest, simplest of actions. Don't then, look for love. Look for pizza. Then was on Unigo shirts. I had a really big Unigo collection That's in incredible. 2019, 2018. Um, and we had that on shirts. I love this. Do you mind signing the back for me of the sticker? Yeah, of course. Okay. I, I mean, I really do that. not yes, of course I mind. Yeah. <laughs> yes, of course I'll do it. <laughs> no, I mind. Yes, I mind. This is so special. I'm so happy that you, I'm excited about this marker. I'm Although have I don't to, like, think this is gonna adhere. I don't know if it will, but we're gonna just like oh, yeah, very much protect it. Oh my God. <laughs> That's so special. <laughs> Thank you so much. I'm not gonna touch it because I just want it to like I know, dry. Try, hopefully it'll dry, but I don't know. Look at that. Look at that. Look at that. <laughs> I have an original. I have an original. You have an original. I'm gonna, I'm gonna I try to get like a double name. frame. Oh no, but that's okay. Oh. This is this is great. Next time. This is n- next time. Thank you so much. Next time. <laughs> yeah. Um well thank you so much for coming in and, and sharing thank your, you so your much story for of, me. of of your mental health journey and, and love, self-love, love for others. Um, I think that love comes in all forms and I think love is a very beautiful thing and you used a very special word for love, which I think it's sacred and it's not mm, just sacred. Yeah. Love for others isn't as just as, is just isn't sacred. It's also the love you have for yourself is equally as sacred. And I think people need to explore mm-hmm. the love they have for others to the love they have for themselves. Yeah. And, um, and it's an ongoing journey you forever. Know? Like the, so, the, so ebbs and, and flows. The loving your part self is something mm-hmm. that, you know, is something you're always going to have to work on, I think, yeah. in some ways. And thank you for putting pen to paper and words on the digital space that are otherwise sometimes so negative and giving people a positive kind of view on what it means to be a human, even in our darkest times. And it's very special. So thank you for spending this time with us and, and yeah, sharing so your gift with us. Me. Yeah, absolutely. If people want to find out more about what you're doing, your book that's coming out, yep, yep. Uh, where can they find you? Well, you can find me on Instagram at Timothy Goodman. I'm also on Twitter, but I don't use Twitter that much anymore. Um, but yeah, definitely on Instagram. And my book, my graphic memoir, I always think it's forever. A love story. Oh, God, the way that <laughs> hits. I always think it's forever. Oh, I always think hits. it's forever. We'll be out January 31st. It's for Simon and Element and print of Simon and Schuster. I'm very excited about it. Um, you can pre start, you know, you can pre-order it now um, on Amazon or at your favorite card. indie book 
bookstore, bookstore so, book yeah. place book place you know um well thank you again for coming on and thank you. for those of you listening those of you watching thank you so much for joining us hope you found something or heard something or saw something that opened up your heart and your mind just a little bit more uh so much love for me to you we'll see you next time bye-bye